Following the launch in 1957 of the Soviet Union's Sputnik 1, the space race began. Surprised that the Soviet Union had shown more advancement in its scientific achievements, the world looked to the United States as a lagging competitor. Military power, missile technology, and the overall national defense of the United States came into question within hours of Earth's first artificial satellite. In the evening hours of the 31st of January 1958, the successful launch of Explorer 1 off Cape Canaveral cemented the American effort to catch up to the Soviets, while simultaneously the United States Air Force was starting Project Mercury. Running from 1958 to 1963, Project Mercury would have the singular goal of putting the first human into orbit. This goal, while lofty at the time, would require the United States to surpass its moniker as underdogs in the space race. To the surprise of everyone, including leaders of Project Mercury, on the 12th of April 1961, the Soviet Union put cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin into a single orbit around the Earth. The Soviet Union was now not only leading the space race, but it was leaving the United States behind. Pushing ahead with Project Mercury, NASA put the first American in space less than a month after Gagarin's flight. On the 5th of May 1961, Alan Shepard aboard Freedom 7 on a Mercury Redstone rocket became the second human being to enter space while on a non-orbital trajectory. Following a second ballistic flight into space by Gus Grissom, and more than 10 months after Gagarin's flight, on the 20th of February 1962, John Glenn aboard Friendship 7 on a Mercury Atlas rocket became the first American and third human being to orbit around the Earth with three rotations. With a total of 20 unmanned missions and six crewed missions, Project Mercury tested the limits of American ingenuity. The Mercury capsule had allowed American astronauts to remain in low Earth orbit with novel life support and early directional control. Let's delve deeper into its directional control or its attitude control system. This is the Mercury capsule in black. The red portion is the escape rocket and connecting tower to be used while on the pad or shortly after liftoff. The capsule has seating for one astronaut and has within it everything they would need. For the first flights, Shepard and Grissom had suborbital trajectories. They reached their peak altitude or apoapsis at around 188 kilometers while the capsule also traversed downrange into the Atlantic, but never reached full orbit. The trajectory is the same as pictured without the orbital portion, meaning the capsule went up into space and then re-entered the atmosphere. For orbital flights, like that of Glenn and astronauts after him, the capsule would need to maneuver in space. With only the capsule making it to orbit, all systems required had to be self-contained for directional control. This manual cover from NASA does a good job of showing a cutout view of the Mercury capsule in orbital flight. An attitude control system would be required to accomplish steady orbital flight and to prepare the capsule for re-entry. Using heated hydrogen peroxide gas coming out of thrusters placed in specific parts of the capsule, the control system would maneuver and control the capsule's roll, yaw, and pitch. The capsule's roll resembles an airplane turning left or right. The capsule's pitch resembles an airplane climbing or descending. The capsule's yaw resembles the movement of an airplane's tail. Various thrusters were used on the capsule, differentiated by power. For the control of pitch and yaw, 1 pound and 24 pound thrusters would be used. To control roll, 1 pound and 6 pound thrusters would be used. The thrusters provide angular accelerations of 0.5, 3, and 12 degrees per second. Along with horizon scanners in different axes, four sets of thrusters were placed at 90 degree intervals along the cylindrical top portion of the capsule for pitch and yaw. And two sets of roll thrusters were placed 180 degrees apart on the bell-shaped portion of the capsule. Let's take a sped up view of how the Mercury capsule moved in orbit using its attitude control system. First, one full revolution of roll Next, one full revolution of pitch. And lastly, one full revolution of yaw.
The reaction control system would have specific requirements that it needed to maintain. First, the ability to provide a 180 degree yaw maneuver following separation from the booster in order to achieve a zero roll and minus 34 degree pitch attitude. Second, to maintain attitude at all times within plus minus 10 degrees of accuracy. Third, to maintain attitude within plus minus 5 degrees of accuracy during retro rocket firing. Four, to achieve re-entry attitude of plus 1.5 degrees pitch and maintain it until 0.05 g's of deceleration were experienced. Five, to provide a re-entry roll rate of 10 degrees per second to minimize touchdown dispersion and to control pitch and yaw oscillations to two degrees per second during said re-entry. Let's take a look at what the 180 degree yaw maneuver might have looked like after booster separation. You'll notice the retro rockets firing at the end of the simulation to begin the process of re-entry back to Earth. The control system would be divided into automatic, semi-automatic, and manual subsystems, all of which would utilize the decomposed hydrogen peroxide gas for thrust. For the automatic side of the control system, roll and pitch thrusters, horizon scanners, vertical and directional attitude gyroscopes, along with rate gyroscopes, would feed to a control logic board. The board, through commands to the solenoid valves, would use the automatic system fuel supply to control the thrusters firing. The system in its entirety makes up the automatic stabilization and control system. The semi-automatic system would use roll and pitch horizon scanners along with vertical and directional attitude gyroscopes and rate gyroscopes to feed rate and attitude indicators that would be read by the astronaut. The astronaut would then use the rate command system on the hand controller to enable presets that would send valve commands to the solenoid valves for semi-manual thrust activation. In fully manual mode, the astronaut would use the data, reading the rate and attitude indicators, along with the view from his periscope and window to directly influence the thrusters through a mechanical linkage that directly opened and closed the valves depending on what he moved on the linkage. The fuel supply for the control system with separate systems for auto and manual fed the semi-automatic system from the manual supply. The horizon scanner for roll maneuvers faces forward. The horizon scanner in charge of pitch would face to the side on the top of the cylindrical portion of the capsule. The displayed attitude information is derived from the automatic stabilization and control systems, attitude gyroscopes, and the rate signals are taken from a separate set of rate gyroscopes. The same rate gyroscopes are part of the rate stabilization and control system in semi-automatic and manual modes. In fully manual mode, the hand controller inside the capsule would use a twisting motion of the linkage to control yaw a forward and back motion to control pitch, and a left and right motion to control roll. This chart illustrates the system performance during the first crewed ballistic flight with Commander Shepard. Following capsule separation, the automatic stabilization and control system provides 5 seconds of rate damping, then the 180 degree yaw maneuver. The system then drops into orbit mode of control for a short period. Manual control can be observed at t equal to 331 seconds, and thereafter, yaw rates are manually controlled to no less than 3 degrees per second. For this flight, on average, the yaw error during the rocket firing period was approximately 6 degrees, equaling a possible downrange error of 10 nautical miles. Finally, let's take a look inside the Mercury capsule. Directly ahead of us, you'll see the viewport for the capsule periscope that would allow the astronaut to look outside the capsule. Just above that, the main clocks for the capsule and the mapping element available to the astronaut are visible. Above this, we'll find the roll, pitch, and yaw rate indicators available to the astronaut. Off to the right side, various gauges and switches, including the main on-off AC bus for the attitude control system. Further down, other switches that would include antennas and other systems. To the left of the periscope, we'll be able to see the attitude control system mode select switches, including pull and push switches for pitch, yaw, and roll control, along with another switch for manual control. All of these would be used when in manual mode, the astronaut could use the mechanical linkage off to his left hand. The fuel remaining for the system can be seen here with an orange background for both automatic and manual fuel tanks. 
Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed content like this, please consider liking, sharing, subscribing, and don't forget to turn on the notification bell to get more content from us as it's uploaded to YouTube.